Despite the success, Chambers still had a problem. He had proved a plane could take off and land on a ship if it had a large platform built over its deck. In the context of the state of aviation at the time, wheeled aircraft uh, were not really a benefit to a ship where platforms would obstruct guns and otherwise interfere with a warship's primary mission of employing gunnery at sea. And so at the time, it would, didn't look practicable to have aircraft that could fly on and off ships. However, because of Curtis and his breakthrough work on developing the hydro airplane, it looked like we might have an aircraft that could operate with a ship without interfering with the use of its guns. Responding to a challenge from the Secretary of the Navy, Curtis offered to conduct a third aviation experiment for the Navy, this one using a seaplane in San Diego. On the morning of Febru February 17, 1911, he took his new hydro aeroplane design out to the cruiser USS Pennsylvania anchored in San Diego Bay, came up alongside, had the ship's boat crane lower its hook to a special harness that he had rigged and was hoisted aboard onto the cruiser's boat deck. After he dined with the ship's officers in the wardroom, they simply reversed the process, lowering his aircraft back into the water and then he returned to his camp at North Island. With this demonstration, he was able to prove that the new aircraft designs could in fact operate from any gunnery ship without interfering with the ship's main battery. After successful demonstrations using both land and seaplanes, the Navy moved slowly toward developing naval aviation over the winter and spring of 1911. On 8 May, Chambers prepared requisitions for two Curtis biplanes. One, the Triad, was to be equipped for takeoff and landing on land or water. Though these requisitions bore the signature of Captain Chambers and not the Chief of the Bureau of Navigation, this act on 8 May 1911 is officially recognized as the birth of naval aviation. The next task was to train select Navy and Marine Corps officers for aviation duty. An experimental aviation facility was quickly established at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. First Lieutenant Alfred A. Cunningham, USMC, becomes the first Marine Corps officer assigned to flight instruction and is later designated Naval Aviator No. 5. By June 1911, Curtis was busy training more naval aviators at his North Island facility. It was the beginning of a long-term trend of government-private cooperation in the introduction and development of new technologies. Longing to be part of the action, Ely, a civilian, appealed to Chambers for a role in the Navy's new program. Chambers was in a difficult position in his office. He had no real budget. He had no real assistance. He was asking and receiving the help of Curtis Aircraft to do these things on speculation. And when Ely comes to him looking for a job, as they realize that the Navy is really going to invest in aviation, he still doesn't have an ability to give him a job yet. With no work from the Navy, Ely and Mabel return to the exhibition circuit. On 19 October 1911, less than a year after his first successful flight from the deck of USS Birmingham, Ely was flying in an exhibition in Georgia when he crashed and was killed. It's hard to know what other contributions to naval aviation Eugene Ely might have made, but chances are they would not have been confined to the cockpit. A hundred years ago, he was trying to get into a more technical field and get out of this daredevil life of going from one air show to another. He had submitted a number of requests to, for jobs that require more brain and less daredevil activity. Had he been received, had there been money for more and deeper research, chances are Ely would have become somebody that we respect for research and development. He never got that opportunity. Meanwhile, the Navy expanded its aviation training. In January 1914, the aviation unit based at the Naval Academy in Annapolis arrived in Pensacola, Florida to establish a flying school. While Curtis had filled the Navy's initial aircraft order in just seven weeks, the pace of naval aviation developed slowly until World War I. When America entered the war in 1917, 
The first U.S. military unit to reach France was the Navy's first aeronautical detachment. But naval aviation was not exactly a potent force, possessing only 109 aircraft, most of which were obsolete. For the remainder of the war, however, naval aviation played an important role searching for German U-boats. By war's end, naval aviators had flown 22,000 flights, totaling more than 3 million nautical miles, and the Navy's inventory of planes quickly grew to more than 2,000. It was a war in which the Navy truly earned its wings. For the first time, the submarine had been challenged from the air. During the war, the British made huge strides to counter German Zeppelins over the North Sea. By war's end in 1918, the British had two ships that could operate the latest combat aircraft from their flight decks, an achievement that made a strong impression on the U.S. Navy. Both the U.S. and Japanese navies were determined to follow the British example, and soon it was a three-way race to develop a powerful carrier fleet. After the war, the U.S. fleet shifted to California to face its next likely opponent, Japan. Aviation activity, however, continued on both coasts. In 1922, America's first carrier, Langley, was commissioned in Hampton Roads. But San Diego quickly grew in importance to aviation as well. Because it had a major naval air station on the water's edge, San Diego's North Island became the home for the Navy's fledgling carrier arm. There was also new aviation leadership within the Navy. Having given birth to a bold idea, Captain Chambers stepped aside in 1914 for a rising generation of naval officers who he had inspired. Captain Mark Bristol replaced Chambers as the officer in charge of naval aeronautics. His office space consisted of one drawer in the desk of Rear Admiral Bradley Fisk, an aide to the Secretary of the Navy. By 1921, the Navy saw much greater value in aviation when it placed Admiral William Moffat at the head of the new Bureau of Aeronautics. A master politician, he maintained official support for naval aviation against the Army's Billy Mitchell, who pushed to place all military aviation into a separate Air Force. Another of the officers following in Chambers' footsteps was Captain Joseph Mason Reeves, whose job it was to make airplanes a useful element of the fleet. Captain Reeves arrived when carrier aviation was still very much in an experimental stage and the personnel involved were really evaluating equipment and aircraft. He wanted to shift gears dramatically into finding ways to make aircraft tactically relevant to the battle line. For example, he posed questions to his personnel saying, how many aircraft can you possibly carry on these ships? How quickly can you land them and take them off? What's the best way of conducting an aerial torpedo attack? How do you commence uh, scouting operations? What's the best formation to use for that? And so he shifted the paradigm dramatically for naval aviation into going from the experimental into the tactical. Reeves had gained his insight into the critical importance of aircraft during two tours at the Naval War College, one as a student, the other as head of the tactics department. Building on the work of Reeves and the Langley, the Lexington and Saratoga and their North Island-based air groups revolutionized naval exercises, including successful mock air raids on the Panama Canal and Pearl Harbor. Dive bombing and new fighter tactics were developed in the San Diego region, making carrier aviation a lethal threat to land as well as naval targets. Carrier aviation rapidly became a prestige arm of the Navy, and senior surface officers like Ernest King and William Halsey earned their wings to get a carrier command. By 1935, San Diego was the home to all four of the Navy's carriers when the USS Ranger, America's first purpose-built carrier, joined her three sisters. When war finally came to the Pacific, innovations in dive bombing and fighter tactics perfected over San Diego's waters contributed to victories at Coral Sea and Midway. It was carrier aviation which essentially stopped the Japanese advance in the Pacific in 1942, first at the Battle of Coral Sea near Australia in May, and then a month later at the climactic Battle of Midway near the Hawaiian Islands. Later, when the American carrier force had built up to an irresistible level, the carrier task forces were able to cover the American amphibious advance across the Pacific and driving their, their forces all the way to the shores of Japan. 
With America's industrial might fully engaged and employing the sound doctrine established in San Diego, powerful carrier task groups roam the Pacific, covering the amphibious advance, battering the Japanese fleet, and eventually striking the Japanese home islands. Throughout the long Cold War that followed victory, San Diego sustained naval aviation during the demanding transition to jet aircraft and combat in the Korean and Vietnam Wars, as well as reinvigorating fighter tactics with the Top Gun School at Miramar. The story of naval aviation has many heroes. They include Captain Washington Chambers, who early on recognized aviation's vast potential. Glenn Curtis, an industrialist who was able to turn a vision into reality. Eugene Ely, a civilian posthumously awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross for risking his life in that first bold experiment. Their acts and those of thousands of others have led to today's carrier forces, a lethal weapon of war and keeper of the peace. Today, Hampton Roads hosts the Atlantic Fleet's carriers, while San Diego is still the home of America's carrier force in the Pacific. Together, a potent strike force defending the nation that is safer thanks to 100 years of technology, innovation, and personal courage, turning a simple idea, flight, into an unbounded capability for the United States Navy.